any other new ones that come up, you can be alerted to that way. So, on to the interview with Jan Hill. So, warm welcome to you, Jan. You're going to talk to us today about um, your new book, Brain Savvy HR, a neuroscience evidence base, um, but really sort of why HR needs to be brain savvy. Um, She's published this book not long ago, on the 23rd of May. Now, I didn't know anything about neuroscience before I met Jan, and I'm almost halfway through a book, and it's actually blowing my mind. Um, it's really well written, very practical, very easy to understand, which is, um, which is the key bonus for myself. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about Jan and her book. Um, and don't forget, everybody on the line at the moment, at the end of the webinar, I am going to let you know how you can all get your free Amazon Kindle copy too. So stay tuned, and right at the end, I'm going to sort of give you a link that will enable you to get there as well. So without further ado, welcome, Jan. I'm sure you can do a better job of introducing yourself than I ever could, so um, I'll pass it over to you. So hi, Jan. Thanks for coming to talk about your new book, and um, could you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, please? Hi, everybody. Thank you, Liz. Um, so... A little bit about me. So I'm a sort of long-term HR person, um, more years than I wish to share with the people on the webinar. <laughs> um, and I guess my HR career has been in two chunks. So the first chunk was as an HR practitioner, mainly in HRD roles for big global financial institutions. Mm -hmm. um, those financial institutions kept getting taken over, and I eventually ended up in a COO role, which is the sort of role in a bank w that looks after all of the non-revenue producing areas, so kind of operations, finance, HR, um, all of those sorts of areas. And I got that role really because I knew two banks who were merging and was able to really do all the change management around that merger. Okay. Um, those banks merged again with someone else, and at that point I kind of thought I've had enough of this and set my own organization up, which has gone through lots of iterations, and Head, Heart, and Brain is the latest of those iterations. Um, and what we did when we set up Head, Heart, and Brain is really want to provide an offering around leadership development and particularly HR capability where we do a lot of work that looks at three main areas, really what, what the name says. So it looks, we work with the head, so the rational content that people need to know to do their jobs well. But we also work with the heart, which is the emotional side, the piece that gets us engaged. And mm -hmm. actually, as we'll talk about a bit more later, actually means we do something different. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, the, the brain is about the neuroscience. So um, taking the findings from neuroscience and interpreting what that means for HR and leadership. So that's a little mm. bit about me. Okay. Um, you're one of the first people to gain the um, only recognized qualification in neuroscience? Is yeah, that right? Did, that's right. I did um, a, a postgraduate um, program in neuroleadership, which is the application of neuroscience to leadership and change. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was the kind of second cohort through with that. Um, it's a global program. All kind of run virtually and accredited through Middlesex University. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Um, now, Jan, one of the things I was um, quite interested in is what, what made you write the book in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, very big book. It must have taken you. <laughs> it's it's um, interesting to know sort of where you start from. Um. So I guess there were a couple of reasons that made me write the book. One was we'd been getting amazing results working with clients using neuroscience, particularly in change and in capability development, so really helping people to understand how they changed behavior and how they were more effective in their jobs. Yeah. So that was one reason we wanted to share some of our experience with um, HR colleagues. 
-hmm. The other reason was we kept getting our clients saying to us, why do I need to know about neuroscience? Kind of, I keep hearing about neuroscience, but what does it mean for me as an HR practitioner? And so we see the book very much as a, a dip-in book. So it's interesting, Liz, you're half th halfway through it, but mm. we really wrote it for people to be able to dip into it and look at the chapters that were of interest to them. So yeah. when you look at the book, you'll see there are chapters that are about reward, about performance, management. There are also chapters about leadership development and training. Um, so it kind of covers all of the specialisms of HR as well as a big section on how HR practitioners can apply some of the thinking in neuroscience to their own mm. work so that they're more effective. Mm -hmm. okay. um, what, so you sort of mentioned earlier why, why, sort of, um, why, why would HR people need to know about it? Why, why should they know? Why, you know? why should they care about neuroscience in general? Well, I think at a high level, what neuroscience is doing is verifying some of the kind of principles and theories that in HR we use around um, people development and change. And, and that's why we called the book an evidence base. What's the evidence we share with the business about why some of our policies and practices will work? So there are things coming through from neuroscience that agree with what we've traditionally done, but equally there are some findings that are being, beginning to challenge some of what we've typically done in HR. Um, so I think that's one reason for HR people to, to want to know about neuroscience. It really gives them evidence of, of, you know, that back mm. up their policies and practices. I think the other thing is you know, as HR practitioners, we're always really trying to provide a better service to the business, to provide a better way of making change happen, of developing people, of rewarding people, and so on. And I think the neuroscience gives us some really kind of interesting ideas um, that, again, in our experience, um, we find that business leaders really like the fact that there is this evidence base, there is this science behind it that kind of answers the question of why should I do these things, particularly mm. around what has traditionally been called soft skills. So it gives you the answer why for um, persuading leaders to do some of the things that we kind of intuitively know work. Yes. Yes, I thought, when I was reading it, I, thought, I do feel that well, you, you're talking so much sense in the in the book. It's um, it, it's and when, when you sort of look at it in in isolation, you can really see how it would work. You know how you can adapt and change and put that into practice. It's um, it is it is on that basis. Brilliant. Isn't it not just another fad though? Do you not think, Jan? You know, there's a lot of these <laughs> things that go on. <laughs> well, one of the things we did was uh, some for the book was some research around kind of where are the HR community um, in their thinking about neuroscience. And to be honest, there were a fair few skeptics in the, um, in the research population. And I think that's, you know, not surprising at, at this stage of, of events. It is still quite new. I think a lot of people are very curious about it, but we're in that stage of a change of um, ideas where, um, you know, a few early adopters are beginning to use the neuroscience and beginning to get some really good results like we did. Um, mm. And in the book, actually, there are a number of case studies covering kind of the whole gambit of, of HR practice, really, that are case studies about where people are are applying new neuroscience and the sort of results they're getting or beginning to get. Uh -huh. um, but the other thing is, you know, it is quite different and our brain likes to be predictable. It likes to be able to predict what's happening and some of what the neuroscience is saying is challenging the way we think about things in HR and that in its turn will mean that some people kind of 
react against that and move away from um, some of the ideas. What we saw in our research was, you know, about 8 to 12 percent of people kind of say they know about neuroscience and they're doing something active with it in the business. Sometimes that's formally, so it's been, you know, put into programs and policies, but quite often it's informal. It's informing the way that HR business partners, for example, talk to, to their business colleagues. Um, so, you know, I think to sum up, what we're seeing is this is very early days. A few early adopters are getting good results as people learn more about those results and mm -hmm. learn more about the neuroscience because it is, you know, there's, there's some technical things you need to kind of understand mm -hmm. even if, um, you know, the way we hope we've discussed those in the book are quite accessible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, it's fascinating. I mean, you've created this, this, a core model as well, which is sort of a really good, a really good sort of way of understanding how it how it impacts. But it, I, I don't know if there's anybody else is on the line that maybe some people don't know a lot about neuroscience. But what what do you think are the four main things that HR professionals need to need, should should know about it? Well, I think um, the four things that are really well. Um, verified and mm. well researched mm. are probably mm. first of all the the idea that our brain constantly scans for threat and reward so right. if you think about um, survival basically it was really important that people noticed as they evolved what were the things that might kill them so that they couldn't pass their genes on to the gene pool. And mm. our brain notices about three times as much threat as it does reward. So what that means in practical terms in a business context is that our brain is constantly seeking things that might be dangerous for us. And in business, that's often social things. So it's often people who are different to us will give us a sense of threat. And what I mean by a sense of threat is that you avoid that, that situation. You might avoid that person, for example. You might know that there's someone who, say, is on a project team with you who's well-connected and really understands kind of what's going to be helpful to get the project implemented, but you just tend to kind of avoid that person. You never get round to making a coffee date with them or hanging back after the project meeting and chatting to them. And what that probably is, is somehow that person triggers a sense of threat for you. Maybe they've embarrassed you at some time in the, in the past, or maybe they remi even remind you of someone who you don't like. And that's your brain kind of sending you a signal that says, be careful, this could be dangerous you know, either fight this situation or f avoid it, you know, the fight or flight mechanism. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, those things happen in a nanosecond. So you're responding, you're reacting like that before you can logically um, understand why you're reacting like that. If we calm down, you know, if we step back and look at the situation rationally, we can often overcome that threat response, but it takes some self-awareness and you need to be able to notice that you're kind of not, not getting around to having coffee with this useful person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the other okay. th side of this mm -hmm. equation is obviously reward. And, you know, there are lots of things that make us feel good that we probably don't really... Um, pay sufficient attention to in a business context. Which leads me on to the second thing that I think is, is really important, and that's social connection. Right. Um, so there's a neuroscientist called Matt Lieberman who's written a really brilliant book called Social, Why Our Brain is Wired to Connect. And it's Lieberman's hypothesis that we actually, as humans, developed a big brain in order to understand each other better. And right. the reason why we need to understand each other is because um, 
as humans, we can't really survive without the help of our colleagues, without the help of our um, group. So if you think about a human baby, they can't actually survive without getting their carers to put their own needs um, into the background and help the child to survive. You know, and any anyone who's got children knows what that feels like when they've been up in the middle of the night um, for months and months on end. Absolutely, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The other thing that only we believe only humans can do is read each other's minds. So we have something called the mentalizing system or the theory of mind that enables that, which is a particular part of the brain that's completely different to sort of logical, rational reasoning. And that part of the brain allows us to be able to, to some extent, predict how other people are going to behave and put ourselves in their shoes, if you like. And it's these social things that often create a sense of reward in business. So it's rewarding to work with other people. It's rewarding at a brain level to help other people, to be charitable. It's rewarding to teach other people things. Um, and sometimes we kind of probably underemphasize some of that, I think, in, in some businesses. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, I, I, I'd agree with you there. Mm. The other key thing, Liz, I think, is um, that the brain is kind of has developed to push most of what we do down into the limbic brain area. So this is an older part of the brain, um, and it's where our habits reside. And the reason it does that is it's much more energy efficient to run things from this limbic area. It and habits are energy efficient for the brain so you know you you automatically go to pick that biscuit up in the when you walk into a meeting you don't really think through a logical process of saying am i hungry do i want a biscuit is this biscuit going to be good for me you just mm -hmm. you pick it up and you eat it before you've even really thought about what your motivation is and that's habit and Another neuroscientist called Kevin Oshner believes that something like 70% of everything we do is habit. And that includes most of the way we do our job. So um, habits are really good because they, it, you know, it means we don't have to constantly kind of think about what we, we do. We, we do it semi-automatically. Um, the downside is when we want to change, particularly in business change, people have to create new habit, and that's not going to happen just by telling them to do it, because habits have driven out of this older Olympics part of the brain, the kind of logical, rational part of the brain um, is needed to overcome those automatic behaviors. And that rational part of the brain gets tired very quickly. That's why we tend to kind of fall back on our good intentions, either, you know, when we've had a stressful day, at the end of the day, when we're very tired, those sorts of things. So there's a particular way in which, you know, I think the neuroscience can help um, guide us, particularly in kind of change and getting people to adopt new way of working that overcomes some of those habitual behaviors. Interesting, interesting. And what's, what's, is, there an, is there another one? Is there a fourth one? There's a fourth one, and yeah. that's the role of emotions. <laughs> 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 now, I think emotions have become a kind of a bit of a dirty word in, um, in business, and they're just coming out of that phase. And I think what the neuroscience is really showing us is, first of all, that Everything we do it has an emotional component, and certainly all our decision making has an emotional component. Um, it, it would seem that you know people who have damage to um, the emotional centers of the brain, uh, whilst they're you know perfectly can function perfectly well um, 
to do analytical sort of, you know, to have a conversation with you and things like that. When it comes to making a decision, if that part of the brain is damaged, they're, they're really unable to make even the simplest of decisions. So, um, you know, one man who uh, uh, had brain damage in this area, um, what the researchers found was, he, you know, he couldn't make a simple decision like what restaurant to go and have lunch, what sandwich to buy, you know, what was the date of, of his next um, medical appointment because the emotional tag that went with those decisions was no longer there, was no longer being applied because of the brain damage. What this means in business is I think we need to do a lot more to help people understand the role of emotions and to use them in a helpful way rather than trying to um, pretend they, they don't matter. The other thing, though, where there's a lot of research been done, again, by Kevin Oshner, is, um, you know, traditionally in business, we think of emotions as something we should suppress and hide. What he has found is that actually heightens um, the emotions in our, in our body and in our brain, sending kind of stress chemicals around the body, um, and it, it, that's actually probably the worst thing you want to do. So some of the work we've been doing with leaders is helping them to ha have alternative ways of dealing with their emotions that are much more both effective mm. and healthy. Mm. I've, worked in, I've worked in a number of businesses where it's just, it's, you know, if you're emotional, then you, effectively you're weak within that organization. And it's um, interesting that it's a quite an old old way of sort of looking at it, isn't it? But oh, it's, it's very interesting. I think that's topic. right. Mm. And, I, I, you know, I think as people, you know, one of the things for HR practitioners, I think, is if you understand some of the neuroscience, you can have a discussion with a, with a manager or a leader about it or mm. even kind of it gives you a lot more awareness of what's going on yourself. Mm. Yes. Yes, and understand that. You've got emotionally, what do they, what's the terminology people use about sort of emotionally um, defunct? Do you know what I mean? They work emotional without the emotion. Emotional yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, yes. And it's, it's, it's that, um, it's sort of, I know a lot of people like that, actually, <laughs> to do with reading your book, Jan. <laughs> uh, how, do, how do we implement that then into HR, then, I wonder? I mean, what's, insofar as sort of examples of sort of how, how that's sort of played out, where, where would you take that? Well, well, let's take a couple of the examples. Mm. So you mentioned our core model, and the way we, what core is basically saying is, um, what are the areas in which threat or reward is likely to be triggered? And what core stands for is certainty. So if, as we mentioned before, the brain likes to be able to predict what's going to happen, and when it can't predict, it feels a sense of threat. Right. And when there's a sense of threat, it will move away from it. So in a change situation, for example, if you're trying to introduce um, a new business model or new ways of working, that's going to kind of make that harder. And so the more you can help people to have a sense of certainty, to take some control over that change for themselves, the less resistance you're going to get. The O in core stands for options. So we know from the neuroscience that even having a sense of choice is rewarding. So mm -hmm. saying to someone, you know, we could do it this way or this way will probably get you um, further than just telling people one, one route to the change. Okay. The R is about reputation. So in change situations, our sense of where we are in the social hierarchy um, which is a kind of map that we all hold in our head, whether that's in our work group or our family group, we kind of have an intuitive sense of who's more important to, than us and who are we more important than. The trouble is in change that that sense gets um, disrupted because, you know, what was important is less mm -hmm. important. Um, you know, jobs that were considered um, high in the hierarchy are being kind of changed or, or even eliminated. And again, if you can help people to 
um, have more of a sense of reward rather than a sense of threat about the, around their sense, sense of reputation, it can make the change easier. So things that you can do are um, training gives people a sense of reward, um, giving them um, a role in the change will give them a sense of reward, those sorts of things. And then finally, the E is for equity. So making sure that what is happening in the change situation is fair, not just from the um, end point, the outcome, but also the process that you go through. So we use that core model with our clients to help them both plan their change to monitor how the change is going, um, and to as a diagnostic if things aren't going very, you know, very well for some reason. Mm. You can also use it if you think about, you know, trying to persuade someone to do something new. Um, it's quite a good kind of little tool for saying, you know, if I'm making this proposal to my boss, for example, that mm. we should adopt a new policy. If I look at the core model, how is my proposal going to impact his or her sense of certainty, options, reputation, and sense of equity? You could you could use that sort of throughout the whole management process, really, couldn't you? I mean, I'm thinking of the situations I find myself in quite frequently, and I'm thinking, you know, if I just adapted that every time I had a, you know, one wanted encourage people, change the way they're doing things, whatever whatever that might be, it's um, it's something that you can sort of just almost have a, there's like a, a checklist of how yeah. is it going to be as, as I go, you know, how's this person going to respond um, to this particular situation? Um, exactly. Mm, you know, and um, I think one of the things to go back to, you know, why are there some people who are skeptical about neuroscience? Mm. One of the reasons I think... Um, there are some questions around neuroscience amongst HR practitioners. Is that sense of threat? Mm. Um, so, you know, if we could adopt more of a kind of giving people a sense of certainty, and that's what we, you know, one step, it's only one step that we hope the book will do, is, is to give people that kind of knowledge, to give them mm. some ideas about how neuroscience can be applied um, and that will increase their sense of certainty. It might mm -hmm. even also increase their sense of reputation because they will know something that their colleagues don't. <laughs> Absolutely. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm wondering, has anybody else got any questions that we've got the listeners today? I'm wondering if there's some questions that somebody might want to ask Jan about um, about neuroscience or sort of what, anything that we've been talking about today. Um, please use that chat box to raise them there. I think it's a very, it's a very, um, it, it's a very full on subject, isn't it really? <laughs> That's the right way of saying it. Um, but there's a lot, there's, there really is a lot to take, uh, to take on um, with regards to sort of how it works. No, when I was reading it, you know, I said, okay, let me just, let me just really digest that. And I kind of think which part of my brain was working when I was reading that particular sentence. So it's, um, there's, there's a lot to take in. Um, if we haven't got any more questions that are coming through, Okay. Okay. Something's coming. So you, what you talked about change. So how how would the um, change? How would it be relevant to the reward? That's one question that's come through. That makes sense. Sorry. Say say the question uh, again, Miss. So you've talked about change. So someone's asked the question um, earlier on the. Um, so how would this be relevant to reward? Reward. So, yeah. Rewarding people in business. There you go. Yes. Um. So. I think one of the areas that is probably pretty controversial, but um, uh, I think at least is quite interesting, is, is some of the science around um, what actually does reward people and motivate people. And we've, you know, we've tended in business to, in the main, pull one lever, and that's the monetary lever. What the science is beginning to say is, that actually the, the social type aspects are as rewarding as money, if not more so. So mm -hmm. doing something for someone else, being altruistic, gives people in the brain the, the same reward, using the same reward networks as giving people a bonus. And I guess one of the things we've done is, is you know, have kind of, our reward policies tend 
to have shifted all in one direction and we're probably neglecting some of those what are in effect free rewards mm -hmm. um, in, in business. And I think we're beginning to see some of that balance come back. Um, but it's, you know, it's going to take some time. Mm. Hope that answers that question. There's, 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 a, there's another question that's come in. That's another good question. It's, there's a great amount of clinical research in the area. Hang on. Is there a great amount of clinical research into the area um, as of yet, or is it the basis mainly theoretical at present? Do you think? No, there's masses of clinical research. So, um, for example, the, the reward. Um, sorry, the core model is backed by numerous. Um, pieces of clinical research that neuroscientists have done all, all around the world, so it's not just an American thing. And, mm. and basically what we did when we developed that model was go back to the science and say, what are the kind of trends that we're seeing here? Um, I, I think the other thing I would say is um, there are a number of sci neuroscientists who've kind of realized that the work that they're doing in the lab has implications for business, has implications for um, uh, individuals for that matter, and have, have become quite kind of adept at being able to um, kind of summarize and talk about what their um, research is showing in a way that's accessible to the layman. So I mentioned Matt Lieberman's book. That would certainly be an example of that. Um, there's another really great book written by um, a neuroscientist in England called John Coates, who's done some fascinating work on traders and the impact of um, kind of uh, basically their intuition on their trading performance and the, the kind of chemicals that impact um, their, their risk levels um, and, and therefore their sort of success in work. So I think there are two things going on. One, there are people like me um, and others who are, you know, tracking what the scientists are, are showing in their, um, in their clinical experiments and, and interpreting what that means for for business, and then there are some scientists themselves who are directly doing research with organisations. Mm. You've, you've got really, some really good reference points, haven't you, in your book as well? I mean, there's just um, quite a big area of different sort of examples of that um, as well. So yeah. that's a good, a good thing to sort of make reference to. There's another really good um, question as well. Can you give some practical example of the way some of your clients have applied this, particularly in training and learning and development? Yes, yeah, certainly. So um, obviously this is an area we work in quite a lot, and there are some case studies in the book as well. But let me give you two examples of the way we've worked with clients using mm -hmm. neuroscience in learning and development and leadership development. So. The first way is what we call behind the curtain. So we use the neuroscience of learning and habit change to design all of our programs. We don't necessarily tell our clients about that, but we're using what we understand about the way people learn in the design so that you, you could basically get better results. So for example, people learn best when they understand what's in it for them, when they gain insight rather than being told about something new, when they are able to apply that to themselves in a practical way, so they're taking that insight and saying, what does this mean for me in my job? Um, and when, um, then we use a, a model to help people change their behavioral habits. So. You know, that's one way in which neuroscience is really beginning to inform um, the way in which people learn. And some of that, you know, I think well-designed programs do already. What the neuroscience does is, again, tell you why it works. And, you know, it can help clients to be able to kind of almost audit their, 
development programs and say, you know, is this following the way in which people actually learn? Mm. Um, the other thing that where we've kind of, and a number of examples in the book of used neuroscience, is really to help people um, understand more about themselves and also more about their team and how they lead their team. So again, we use that core model to help leaders understand how their leadership style may be impacting team members and you know, how they can flex some of those um, four actions, basically. Um, I think you also see quite a, um, we've done quite a lot of work with uh, using some of the neuroscience around influence as well and mm. the stuff on emotions, helping people to have better emotional control. I've got someone you need to work on, Jan. <laughs> 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 I really do. Everything you're saying now, I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. So can I just ask, um, mm. Carolyn, if that... Um, mm -hmm. Oh, she said thank you now. Thank you. Great. Yeah. I think that's answered. I think that's answered. That's brilliant. Brilliant. Um, okay, we're not getting any more questions through at the moment. So if you have one, then please, um, please, please put it up on the chat box. But I think um, before we go any further, was there, there's, a, there's a course, an introduction to neuroscience that you've got running, isn't there? That that's, um, backs up the book. Could you just spend a minute or two just telling us a little bit about what what that's about, please, Jan? Yeah. Um, so I'll say a little bit about the course, but I'll also say something about our breakfast meetings. Um, really? So, as I said earlier, the reason, one of the reasons we wrote the book was because people kept asking us about why neuroscience might be useful to, to them as HR practitioners. Um, and, and we've equally had a number of um, people ask us, you know, what they should know about neuroscience and importantly how you apply it. I mean, it's all very well kind of knowing this stuff in theory, but what does it really mean in practice? is where it becomes really valuable, I think. So um, as part of the launch of the book, we've put together a one-day workshop which really introduces you to these four ideas that we've been talking about here, threat and reward, social connection, habit, and the role of emotions. Um, and the morning is a kind of introduction in, in a quite a practical way. So you get to kind of experience threat and reward, for example. Um, and then the afternoon is really much more about what does this mean in terms of the way I manage change in my organization, um, the way I get um, people to behave differently in the organization, and the way I help people to be more resilient around kind of change and their emotions. Um, and you know, what people get in that is an opportunity to actually take some of those concepts and apply it to things that are actually going on in their business. Um, we run, we're running that program um, in-house for whole mm -hmm. HR teams. Uh, we, we just did a program last week that got really good feedback, and we're also offering it as an, an open program where you could kind of come along with colleagues from all sorts of different businesses. Okay. Um, so so, so the that you can see more details mm. of that on our website. Um, the other thing we do, um, if people are based in London, uh, we run a, um, a, a breakfast club for senior HR people that meets about once every five to six weeks over breakfast, obviously, <laughs> and again takes a topic from um, uh, you know, an HR topic and says, what's neuroscience beginning to, to tell us about this? And what? And so we do a short piece of input around the neuroscience, but really the bulk of the time is an opportunity for people to kind of have a discussion about what they think about um, the, the topic and the science and what it might mean in their organizations. So it's very informal, um, but it's, you know, if people are in London, it's, it's quite quite popular um, and upcoming topics are we've got one on uh, learning and um, behavioral change um, the next we've got one on decision bias and how that impacts um, diversity so those are the sorts of topics that, that we cover 
Okay. If anybody's interested in that, if you just want, to, uh, we can send through some information. I think can't we, Jan, with regard, or you can directly Absolutely, with um, yeah. regards to sort of the flyers or anything like that. If you're interested, do you want to just put the word yes into the chat box, and we can sort of let you know a little bit more about the breakfast meetings and the um, the in the um, introduction to the neuroscience, the, 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 the course that you're going to be running there. Brilliant. Thank you. And what we'll do is, I think we'll send you different to obviously the webinar, the slides and everything, but we'll send you a sort of a, an email with all that information in. So thank you for that. So just write yes in there. That would be brilliant. That's lovely, Jan. Wow. <laughs> what a lot to be, what a lot we've covered there, I think, didn't we? Um, so I bet you're Sitting on the edge of your seats, how are you going to get a copy of this free of this free um, free Kindle Amazon book? Um, before we get to that point, though, um, thank you very very much, Jan, for sitting with us on on that very very interesting subject. And now I'm a recruiter, so insofar as um, the, 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 the neuroscience is more from the management of, within my business, and I found it most useful. But for the HR practitioner, I think it's absolutely invaluable at this moment in time to sort of um, to bring that on board. So fabulous! Mm. Thank you very thank very you, much. Well, thank you pleasure. for asking me. For any other recruiters <laughs> on the line, there are a couple of chapters in the book about. <laughs> Neuroscience and recruitment. Mm. So, <laughs> really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to. Go I'm the kind of per <laughs> and I'm the kind of person that has to read a book or a magazine or anything from front to cover. I'm not very good at delving <laughs> in and out. <laughs> um, you enjoy that's... them when you get to them. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Jan. We've got some people that are interested in getting that information, so I'll get that information to you. That's brilliant. So before I get to that point, we've done our questions. Just to let you know, um, I'm not going to be interviewing next week. I'm going to actually be um, presenting. We're going to be talking about mobile and social recruitment and how you can integrate that into your recruitment strategy, which is, that's what I know about. So I'd be really, really welcome you all to join us next week um, on the 24th, which is a Tuesday, to talk about that for half an hour. Um, some really interesting information coming out and sort of how you can do it, because it really is a hot topic um, of, of, of getting those candidates um, through, through the door and into your business. If you want to view more webinars, as I said before, join our web, uh, look at the website, join our webinar group. It would be great to see you there. Alternatively, connect on social media um, and sort of download the slides, etc. So there are the links for you there. And finally, here's the link. If you want to click this link, and what I'll also do when I end the webinar as well, which will be in a, in a minute or two, um, I'll give you the link so it will take you direct to there. So Jan's kindly offered the um, listeners on the line today the opportunity to download this particular book to their Kindle. If you haven't got a Kindle, you can still download it off the, to a Kindle app. I think that you can get that Kindle app from... Um, can you get it on your desktop? I've not actually tried that out you, yet. Yeah, you can. So you yeah. can get it on your tablet, on your phone, or on your desktop. Brilliant. So you could, you could read so it. If you just go to the Amazon page where the book is, it, it will give you a link to that. And to, to, to download it. Brilliant. So that's where you can get the book. And that's available until Sunday. Is that Sunday evening, John? You've set that up. It till. should be, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so please, um, please go there and get your free copy of today. And thanks you ever so much for those fabulous questions um, and for um, being a really good audience today. It's been such a such an enjoyable webinar, a very different one. This is the first interview I've done, so um, I'm sure I can take a lot out of it, and, and, um, and we can move on. <laughs> So well, it's quite quite a different way of doing it, isn't it? So thank you all for your patience today, um, and um, pleasure pleasure meeting you. All. So thank you. I'm going to end the webinar in just a second. So um, right. I'm going Can to I stop just say talking. Thank now. you to everyone for their interest, and hope you enjoy the book. Lovely. Thank you, Jam. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.